jazz artists would come on their way through their New England tours. And then Jack went to Columbia later on. But the thing that really made him aware of the genius of jazz and the genius of the African-American community that jazz was created from was because of Neil knowing all these terrific people and taking him there into a world that he never would have understood or felt welcome in. And this was a description of him seeing George Sheary, who came from England, but who also, like Yo-Yo Ma, whose family didn't come from Germany, devoted himself to a music, to a culture he wasn't born into, and really learned it with honor and respect, and was a very creative, wonderful player. And you could almost imagine, not only then, but right now, what it's like to be in the center of creativity 
because that's what jazz is all about. Like all great music, is celebrating the sanctity of the moment. That's why Charlie Parker called his song, Now is the Time. You know, when I asked him when I was 21 years old, what's it like, Bird, writing such an old song so long ago? Because he wrote it in 1945. 1952, when I asked him, seven years was a third of my life. So to me, that, was, that was ancient history back then. And uh, he said, now was, is, and always will be the time, because now is the right time. So we're not taking you back when you hear what Jack wrote about in the 40s that's still going on right now. And to do that, master, actor, and he does so many different things from Shakespeare to The Sopranos. He's done all those great programs, and he's one of the best Jack Kerouac readers. Next, along with Jack Kerouac, Mr. John Benamillion. Thanks, Bob. <clears throat> Dean and I went to see Shearing at Birdland in the midst of a long, mad weekend. The place was deserted. We were the first customers, 10 o'clock, and Shearing came out, blind, led by the hand to his keyboard. He was a distinguished looking English man with a stiff white collar, slightly beefy, blonde hair, with a delicate English summer's night air about him that came out in the first rippling sweet number he played as the bass player leaned into him reverently and he thrummed the beat and the drummer Denzel Best sat motionless except for his wrist snapping the brushes and then Sheeran began to rock a smile broke over his ecstatic face and he began to rock on the piano seat back and forth slowly at first but then the beat went up and he began rocking fast his left foot jumped up with every beat and his neck began to rock crookedly he brought his face down to the keys he pushed his hair back and his combed hair dissolved he began to sweat. And the music picked up. And the bass player hunched over. He sat it in. Faster and faster, that's all. Sheeran began to play his chords. They rolled down the piano. In great, in great red showers. You think the man would have time to line them up? They rolled. They rolled like the sea, and folks yelled to him, go! He was sweating, and the sweat poured down his collar. Oh, there he is. That's him. Oh, God. Oh, God, Siri. Yes, 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 yes. Sharing was conscious of the madman that was behind him. He could hear every one of Dean's gasps and imprecations. He could sense it, though he couldn't see it. That's right, said Dean. That's right! That's right! And Sharing smiled, and he rocked. Yeah, he rocked. And then Shearing rose from the piano, dripping with sweat. These were the great 1949 days before it became cool and sophisticated and commercial. But when he was gone, Dean pointed to the empty piano seat, God's empty chair. That's what he said. And on the piano, a horn sat, and its golden shadow made strange reflections along the desert caravan that was painted on the wall behind the drums. God was gone. It was the silence of his departure. 
It was a rainy night. It was the myth of the rainy night. We have another song we'd like to do, someone that was just so terrific and like Jack received certainly quite a bit of recognition, but nothing compared to what he really deserves. And if you go to uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, I just Came to us, look up my Oklahoma Bellboro that the Red Dirt Rangers from Lone Chimney, Oklahoma, gave this just an extraordinary place. They have not only the Woody Guthrie Center, they've got the Bob Dylan's complete archives. They also, and they haven't mentioned this yet, but a lot of us will, and eventually we won't have to because the world will know, they have the archives of another great poet, singer, songwriter named Phil Oak. <laughs> New York Post, I think about a year ago, said, where are the protest singers now that we need them? Then they had a whole article about Phil Oaks. Well, first of all, Phil would be the first one to say he wasn't a protest singer anymore when people say I was an activist. I said, I'm not an activist, I'm just very active. And, and the same thing was true with Phil. He was a poet who addressed life and life in this beautiful, country, crazy country of ours. And when he saw something that he thought was wrong, he wrote about that. And he also wrote about what he thought was right. And he was an extraordinary poet and artist who also was swept up by the folk boom. And when the record industry decided they could take all that money from young people, and uh, by putting them in a certain slot, he became labeled as what are the protest singers? He was much he was much more than that, which we all know. And this is one of his extraordinary song poems about aging. And to tell you the truth, I could tell you a lot about that myself. <laughs> and it's pretty beautiful and wonderful. And it's not just a, the typical song that you would expect it to be. It's just extremely beautiful for people of all ages, because he was a artist and a poet. And again, I have his lyrics because I didn't want to be creative and wreck what doesn't need any improvement. It's already perfect. This is Phil's beautiful song. And I was with him, I guess, about two weeks before he passed away. He was at Folk City. And he called me up on the phone and said, man, they're having this big thing celebrating me. And all these people don't even have a clue of what I've been trying to do, what I am doing, and what I mean to do, and what I hope that they will do. And I came down and played with him all night long, and we did this version. And again, like Woody, Phil didn't really care what melody you used, as long as you got the words right. And this is Phil's <laughs> beautiful song, which I'm sure you all are familiar with, called When I'm Gone. <laughs> I'll have to do it while I'm here. 
And I will breathe the bracing air when I'm gone And I can't even worry about my cares when I'm gone Won't be asked to even do my share when I'm gone So I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here And I won't be running from the rain when I'm gone And I can't even suffer from the pain when I'm gone Can't even say a praise who's to blame when I'm gone So I guess I have to do it while I'm here Wonderful 
wonderful folk tradition that we could often forget about. And when I was with the great David Brosa, some of you may know him, wonderful singer, songwriter from Israel, whose folks established a school, I guess, about 70 years ago, 60 or 70 years ago, where kids from all the different cultures of the Middle East, including people who'd never been to Israel before, and many who were born there and never hung out with people in the different communities, all got together and went to school together, played music, played sports together, got to know each other, learned to speak Hebrew and uh, Arabic and all the different forms of languages that are spoken there. And it's just an amazing, we had a, a wonderful tour of Israel and I learned from him the meaning of the phrase Hadavar Hashi Yashu Bachaim Zelachayot Benadam, which means most important thing in life is to be a real mensch. <laughs> he he um, embodied that and still embodies that. And if you get a chance to hear him, he's such a master, accomplished musician. And he has so much energy that he makes me feel like an old, retired wretch. In comparison, every time I play with him, I'm exhausted before I even start. He's phenomenal and a great guy and a real super gentleman. This is one of the pieces that we played. I was conducting the Ra Na Na Symphony, and all the classical players who were had escaped from Russia and came over there were used to the system in the workers' paradise where if you blow a gig or do something to make the conductor angry, you're sent off for re-education in some salt mine and never come back. So it wasn't like a bunch of happy campers. They all came in and said, this is another gig, I don't want to go to jail. Oh, yeah, should have been a doctor or a dentist, not this. So they were coming looking miserable. And they would see David Bros, who was an international star, and he was the conductor visiting firemen from the US, and expect us to act like Nazis and we had already done our sound check, so we were just not jamming because we all loved to play. And they would walk in. They said, there's the boss and the guest having a good time. And they completely freaked out because we'd be out there playing and wailing. And by the end of the tour, they were all singing and playing and having fun. <laughs> and playing up a storm and playing better symphonically than they did when they started because they forgot that the spirit is what dictates everything in life and in music. And David was just a wonderful person. This is one of the things that we played. In, in, in Israel, they, they called it a, a different name. Each, each country has a different name for the same song. And, uh, and they all claim it's theirs and not anybody else's. So even the countries that hate each other all play this, a lot of the same music. And when they get together and jam out, all that other stuff disappears. And that's what music does, it's like a magical thing to remind us that we're all human and share so much humanity, whether we know it or not, or whether we want to or not. And that's what's so terrific about it and humbling. And this is one of the beautiful, this would be a little medley of the wonderful song of the of David in Lebanon, they, they call it Ma'it Nawashna. And then we're gonna do one called Ayazain, which the great Um Kalsum from Egypt made internationally famous, and now they have different versions of that in different languages. Just like this land is your land, is sung in languages all over the world, and it's a universal song. These two melodies are too. And we're going to ask you to clap along. It uses a traditional instrument called the dumbek. That's the generic name. The dum is the low note. The back is the high note. You learn to play the dumbek by hanging out with Dumbek players who are better than you, and I could give you the names of two or three hundred if you have time. <laughs> in any case. But the pattern, you learn to sing it. Dum, dum, beck. Dum, beck, the beck, dum, beck. The rhythm we're going to use, the taxim, which is dum, dum, beck, dum, beck, dum, dum, beck. And the variations. what that sounds like. And if you go on YouTube, you can see Dombek players playing in a Turkish style, a Greek style, the Armenian style, a Lebanese style. They have Bulgarian Dombek players. Every place almost in the world has their own way of doing it. And I'm going to use the traditional
Irish flutes for that. And you might say, well, how can they play <laughs> Middle Eastern music on an instrument from Ireland? Well, <laughs> very briefly, when I was wondering about that myself, and I went to up to Pakistan and to India and different countries where they use the quarter tone, that's the note between our half tone. The, the, we have an F sharp and a G. And those are considered to be half tone, but between the F sharp and G is a quarter tone. That's the quarter tone. So when I was in India, I saw this amazing flute player. I said, you know, how do you play that quarter tone? He said, oh, very simple. But he didn't have to slide around. He just went right on it. He said, let me show you something. And he picked up the flute, and he started not on this or this. He started on the And from that, he played a perfect major scale. I said, wait a minute. That would take about a month and a half to slide around. I said, how do you do that? He said, it's very simple. And I said, boy, now I've got, just like those TV commercials, you two could be a guitar star, <laughs> the life of the party, become a multimillionaire in a year, and, and get a $99 guitar thrown in for just one lesson. <laughs> so I thought I was going to, I was thought I was going to get that, plus the, the magical, Eastern mystical guru, El Cheapo fast solution. I said, well, I don't see how that's possible. Said, it's so simple. I said, well, what is it? I can tell you. You practice. <laughs> I said, oh. So I transposed that. I just want to tell you all. To uh, When I was at the Marlboro Music Festival, I was the composer in residence, and the great Rudolf Serkin, the pianist, um, used to say, I showed the pianist how to practice. You sing. Pablo Casals said, you must sing on the cello. Wow, 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 wow. And the flute player, Marcel uh, Moyes, would dance around the room and play this fantastically beautiful. I think these famous musicians to play on top of Old Smokey or the Red River Valley <laughs> and sing it and play it and really do something with it to make it personal and in the style of what the music was. And then when I played with Dizzy Gillespie for his 70th birthday, we had this extraordinary band. I was just lucky to be chosen to be horned in it. And he said, oh, and Lawa Schiffer wrote these really hard arrangements. So we were playing away and Dizzy said, all right, fellas, cool it. So we, we stopped and he said, put down your horns. We all put, he said, now, Sing this after I do. So we picked it up. He said, now play it. So we started to play. We couldn't quite get it, but we got a lot closer than we ever would have otherwise. And he said, if you can sing it, you can play it. And that's, I realize whether it's, it's folkloric music or symphony players or whatever the idiom, that's the key for everything. And when one of the great trombone players, Steve Torres, said, Dizzy, I can't sing. He said, everybody's a singer and everybody's a drummer. And folk music always embodies that and you learn to sing. But if you do, that's true with anything and everything. To